Three, testing. One, two, three. Punishment level discussion for you and me. Anyone hears me and sees me, let me know. Give me the thumbs up. Think we're good to go. All right. See and hear. All right. Let's get started, everyone. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the stream. Today, with our lecture, is going to be on punishment levels considerations from a scientific point of view. And I'm going to also add my own experience so you can make your own decisions. What we're doing is I have some notes over here. I think this will be a little, possibly a shorter and sweeter lecture, but I thought this one is important for those of you that are starting to consider punishment in your training plans, especially if we're following along with foundation style dog training, specifically phase three training, where we are using primarily e-collars, although technically from a technical point of view, an e-collar does not have to be used in phase three. Although I push for e-collar use because I believe if it's used the correct way, that it is the most humane way if we are following guidelines placed through Lima um, by Stephen Lindsay's definition. Now, what our, our main objective in this lecture is just how do we start our decision process in regards to what level intensity of punishment to use during training plans. And since this is geared towards the professional, I would like you to have a starting point where you can back up your decisions and not just mimic, make um, well, well-informed decisions when you put together your, your training plans. So first thing that we do want to consider is to consider your foundation before we even think about using punishment, right? Specifically Lima, since, since this lecture is for a foundation style dog training course, and we are gonna use potentially use punishment in a training plan, especially with things like um, habitation plans, which includes housebreaking and, and training, obedience, tra obedience training, where we need the dog to obey during high levels of distraction, we want to look at our, at our training plan. So when we make these considerations at the base of our training plan, we have ethics. And over here, we want to especially consider Lima, which we have a whole lecture on Lima. So if you're not familiar with that, look at Lima. But generally, we want to be able to get results by using the least intrusive and minimally aversive um, and be as minimally aversive as, as possible. And we also want to be sinopraxic, right? So sinopraxis is ultimately, if you are professional dog training, it's not only from an ethical point of view, but for sure I see from a professional point of view, we are more successful when we do address the well-being of both the dog and the human. And we're working on giving them a better bond and a more enjoyable experience when they are together. So we want to consider that as a base when we take the information that is available to us from past scientific experiments and apply it to our training plans and then observe and see if we should tweak from there. Other things that we want to consider, of course, are ABA is, a, is an ethics. And um, so through applied behavior analysis, you will see like everything is not just about punishing behavior since we are talking, since this is just talking about 
punishment in itself in a little bit bubble, but in a small bubble, but not how it can be included in a full training plan. So we want to always consider things like, um, you know, are we are we addressing replacement behaviors? We're talking about the real the real world over here when we apply the punishment. All right. So don't forget this when we go. We talking about studies that have that are just um, that are just studies, studies in a little bit bubble in a bubble that are just addressing punishment in, in itself and it's in its raw form. So know, know your checklist. If someone happens to stumble across this video, um, this is not to replace uh, a training plan, a checklist, doing things in order, understand the mechanics, how to train the dog. You're gonna use this information as one factor in deciding what you're doing within the the checklist so i'm giving you the scientific information here just so you can make informed decisions within the larger the larger plan and in my opinion there's just not enough information out there about punishment and not enough people pointing to good studies about punishment so what i'm doing is i'm just highlighting three studies that you can get to them by right over here where it says studies, studies on punishment. In our knowledge base, I'll have, I'm putting them in a category which you could find them all over here. I'm highlighting three of these four, but I'm gonna start putting more in this section over here too. But I'm highlighting, you know, one of them I would say is a little bit redundant. So I'm highlighting three in this lecture today. And, the first one that I want to talk about is called the effects of punishment intensity during variable interval reinforcement by Azrin. And this was in 1960. Matter of fact, all these studies I, I have over here, this was, um, you know, really during the birth of a lot of these, a lot of these uh, behavioral studies and right after, right after Skinner. These are all in the 60s, all, all three of these, two in 1960, one in 1966, and it, it is valid. That being said, there are lots and lots of studies out there on punishment, but I always like to start with the earliest ones because usually when you get some kind of results from an earlier study, they, they tend not to repeat studies that have showed some some pretty reliable results and you're gonna get variations of these different types of types of studies. So in this one right over here, this study I felt is very important and I'll tell you why. First, what it basically was is, is you can download the study yourself, right? Is And it's about what they were doing is they were having pigeons that were trained to, to peck a disc and they were getting rewarded on a variable interval, right? So they were on a strong reward schedule. If they pecked the disc, they would end up getting getting um, rewards from it. So what they found in the study was that depending on the level of punishment, what they did is they implanted electrodes into these pigeons and what they did is even though while the they while the pigeons were being rewarded for pecking a disc to give the so that was to give the pigeons motivation to do the behavior is they would also get punishment while they were doing the behavior when they pecked when they pecked the 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 disc and what they did is they recorded the results to see what were the effects is how different levels of punishment affected the the pigeons in regards to trying to suppress them from pecking this disc that they were motivated to peck and what they found was that when there was mild levels mild levels of punishment the exact numbers are are in the the study but i believe most of it were levels of uh, of electric shock that I believe it was a minister. I think they varied it in some of the in some of the studies about 0.3 um, milliseconds. I think it was, which is a fraction of a fraction of a second. Is they found that if they did mild punishment, that initially 
when the pigeons experienced the mild punishment with the pecking of the disc is at first it immediately suppressed the pigeons. But then what happened is that the pigeons started to acclimate and they were more and more, they would start pecking it, even though they weren't pecking the disc as much in the beginning as they were before the mild stimulus is that after a set amount of time, they had a full recovery where they were pecking the disc at the same rate for the food with the mild shock as they did before there was ever shock introduced. And then they also discovered this, that as they stepped it up and started increasing the level of the electric shock, is you would, as you stepped it up again, what you would get is you would get a suppression at first of the behavior, but then what would happen after that is eventually you would get a full recovery after suppression where you would get the behavior that the pigeon was motivated to do to eat at the same rate as before they were ever exposed to the electric shock punishment. Then they reached a level which they called severe. They called severe. And what they found there is once they hit a, sec a, a certain level with the punishment, and this is all, I'm not even given numbers. One, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's, and you can download the studies right over there is this is going to be, you know, what, what is considered mild, moderate, severe is going to depend on multiple things with different animals, including, including dogs, right? Um, is that when they raised it to what was considered a severe level, level or what they considered a severe level was when there was at first suppression, but then there was recovery, but so the pigeons were still doing the behavior, but they evened out at a level that was less than what the behavior was before they introduced the severe level of shock, all right? So what we got is they step up and to a certain point with the, with the electric shock is you would get immediate results, but then over time you would get recovery to the point where even though the pigeons were getting shocked, they were doing the behavior they wanted to do at the same rate beforehand. But there was a certain level where they, they were suppressed but they, and they recovered, but not at the same rate. So it was less than. And then what we also have in the study is what they considered a severe level, a very, a very severe level of shock. Then what they considered a very severe level of shock is with the pigeons, is with the pigeons when they were exposed to the very severe level of shock, they were suppressed and then the behavior itself um, over time, basically completely the behavior of pecking the disc almost completely was extinguished. Not at all that they did not peck the disc or very, 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 very little. So depending on the intensity with these pigeons, there were levels that they would recover. The one thing that was in common with all of them is that there was always initially suppression, but then Certain levels, there was complete recovery. Other levels, not complete recovery. And then other levels, almost complete suppression. The other thing that I found interesting about this study is that if, now remember, they were establishing operations with these pigeons, meaning they had to um, give them a, a, a slight drop in weight to make them hungry enough to do to do the experiment and then they were also fed outside of the experiment just not their full the full amount of calories that they would normally that they would normally need so that they were not um you know need to be motivated when they were going to these into these training boxes but they found that the also if you tweaked um their weight they said a slight drop in weight in the experience nearly tripled 
the amount of responses when they were being punished. So this is also a factor, even though this was not really the main point of the, of the experiment, I found it interesting and useful information that you make this pigeon even a little bit hungrier, the amount of responses and their willingness to, I guess, challenge the punishment changes, changes drastically. So how does this, why does this matter as a dog trainer, right? Why does this matter as a, as a, a dog trainer and what are considerate, you know, how could we use this to, uh, you know, how do we use this information when, when considering things in this one is something like housebreaking with a dog or really anything when I'm talking about obedience training right here is training that I would consider we use punishment in a more simpler matter where we're getting the dogs to just, we want to suppress a certain behavior. So let's say something like housebreaking, you know, the dog is sticking its head in the garbage or, or counter surfing or something like invisible, invisible fence training where we want the dog, which I would say is, is a step up more complex than, than typical, typical housebreaking, because we also need the dog, you know, to like run towards the center of the yard where most things with housebreaking, we're simply just, um, teaching the dog not to do certain behaviors, but remember our foundation, we want to make sure that there's replacement behaviors in, uh, in effect. So that's going to also help with there being us using less punishment over here. But now let's suppose this is troubleshooting and making our plans. And remember, we want to be Lima over here. Suppose someone has been doing a good foundation and they've been housebreaking, doing things to housebreak a dog by teaching new habits and they made a lot of progress, but then there's still a few straggling behaviors that they feel that implementing punishment is going to be a good decision for the plan, which, which often is. If we were say using in, um, and this applies to really any type of punishment, but um, electric collars, e-collars e are one of the one of the, the, the best choices when you're keeping records and you're trying to troubleshoot because you can really keep track of the exact level of aversiveness that you are doing is, is, is it, you know, um, if we do certain levels, can we get a false sense of perhaps fixing the problem for the client by getting immediate results where then the dog might possibly be more likely to do the behavior later on or with something like counter surfing and things like that. You know, are we going to get a dog that's going to possibly recover if we do not do the right, do the right level? Also, if science shows that a very severe punishment is less likely to get recovery to the behavior that they want to do. So how do we, as a dog trainer, right, find that right level that's going to work for the dog without overdoing it? If we're considering, if we're considering being, being Lima, these are questions that we ask ourselves. The other things that we question ourselves, and this is, I'm not telling you in this lecture exactly what to do. I'm telling you how to consider things like this is something to ask yourself too. is what is more humane to do to a dog? Is it more humane to do a say what would be labeled as a severe punishment in this study doing more of a higher level correction or punishment to suppress results? that you have to sort of maintain and stay on top of for a longer period of time? Or is it more humane to do a higher level that would be considered very severe and only and do it less or maybe only only once? All right. What is the most what is technically the least aversive? What can possibly be um, the 
least intrusive to the relationship when we're considering things like giving the dog more freedom and stuff like that. So the same thing applies with invisible fence training too, where, um, and of course, obedience training, what we're doing, which is these are things that we are going to talk about when we're doing phase three, phase three obedience. Like what level do we do on the e-collar? How, when do we do it low? When do we, when do we pop it up? So this is touched on in the escape conditioning phase three video where we where we talk about is how long when we're doing when we are doing escape conditioning with the dog is when do we turn it up what level what level do we do with the dog and do we want to use the e-collar for other things teaching the dog punishment um, before we even get to get to phase three so things to consider design your own plans accordingly but don't blindly mimic now this brings us to this other study, which adds to it, which adds to this, adds the discussion, which is called learning resistance to pain and fear effects of overlearning exposure and rewarded exposure in context um, by Miller in 1960. And again, I say all of these you can get to, you can download them. I put like a summary on each of these links and you and you can download it. But this particular study was done with, with done with rats. And it's, you know, and, and three experiments, a total of 100 hungry rats were trained to run an alley for food reward and then given electric shocks at the goal to induce an approach avoidance conflict. These experience, experiments yielded the following results and conclusions, all right? So what they were doing here is we have rats. They were studying rats that were trained to, that were hungry to run to an end of an alley where they would get fed, but then also receive a shock at the, at the same time. All right. Now this one was different. What they did here was that they'd had some groups of rats that experienced um, lower levels, lower levels of shock, as they, as, you know, during um, previous trials where they would get lower levels of shock and then be able to eat the food. But levels where they were still, they had no problem, they were not resistant to eating the, eating the food. They would take these low levels of shock and they would eat the food. And then they had another group of rats that would do the same thing without any shock at all. Um, then what they would do is they compared they compared the two groups of rats where then they had a higher level of shock they sent them both down you know they you know both groups down similar similar alleys to receive food but then receive a higher level of shock and basically that what they found is that the rats that were exposed to lower levels of of shock would still go and eat the food even with a higher level of shock where the rats that were not receiving the lower levels they would not you know they were suppressed they would not go to, after they received the higher levels of shock they would not go and eat the food with the higher levels of of shock and and that's that's what that particular study was in a nutshell over there but they also what also they showed in this um, particular particular study is that they had um is that the same the is that the same results you did not get the same results if it happened outside of context which means if you had rats that were exposed they were exposed to shock outside of that training context it did not necessarily make them resistance to the shock in that context. The other thing what they showed over here is that um, overtraining with reward slowed down the response once exposed to the shock, meaning um, that if they allow, the more they allowed these rats to get, just simply get rewarded more and more and more with the food, um, 
um, overlearning. They already learned it and they're still being reinforced, reinforced, reinforced. I've run down this alley. There's food. It's all a good thing. It's all a good thing that if anything, it made them even more responsive. They were suppressed even more once all of a sudden they were used to being able to do this, being able to do this, and be able to do this. And then all of a sudden they get a higher level, a higher level shock. So, so what this, what this shows us is again, this is related to the other study, but it's not, um, it's not exactly the, the same thing. Cause what we're talking about is in the end is the same level of shock. And then what happens until we reach that point at the end. So how this can relate to dog training, again, is things with housebreaking. If someone is going to be doing housebreaking and suppose they're using some training tool, some collar that only really goes up to a certain level, all right? It go, you, have, you have some training collar and let's just say hypothetically it has level one to 10. That if potentially, and I actually have seen this, I'm saying this because I'm relating my own experience to what I see inside of studies, is that potentially if someone is being, I guess, too nice or not even too nice, they might, it might just seem like it makes sense on paper, which we always want things to make sense on paper before we do it, is that if we're doing training where we're doing lower levels for a longer period of time, especially with something that we're gonna use as punishment, the same sort of device, just a different intensity, that you could potentially, if you do too much, and the dog gets desensitized, basically, um, to this lower level of shock, that once you use a higher level of shock, it might not be as effective compared to if you were not using the lower levels at all, up until that point. And I have also seen this with invisible fence systems, where invisible fence systems, where if you're training an animal on invisible fence system, I generally avoid electric shock altogether during the training process until I know the dog understands that they're supposed to stay in the boundary. And I'm basically, for instance, just doing it with the leash. When they go to the boundary and they hear a beep, I'm just pulling them towards the, towards the center of the yard. So then once the dog understands, if we do use, um, an say an invisible fence system that does use a higher, much higher level uh, level of intensity with, with shock compared to what most people are doing with obedience training, is that once they receive that higher level of shock once and they weren't getting used to it on lower levels, it tends to work better. The it's less resistant to the dog challenging it. And sometimes that's the only one that you need, which we can go, this ties in together with the, with the um, study, the study that I was showing before, right? But there are, depending on the level, it does hit a point where generally the dogs don't have recovery. They're not going to generally, to, to generally challenge it. Other things that fall, even though this isn't really the exact subject, but I thought it was interesting, is, is this study um, over here about learning resistance to pain and fear. A lot of this was not gear in 1960. They were not doing this study necessarily um, to help dog trainers out. They were looking at things of how this relates to other form of stress resistance, like pain, fear, fatigue, frustration, noise, temperature, stuff like that. Meaning if you, if you have, if you have, you know, humans or really any animal exposed to things to stress in smaller amounts, does it then help them eventually deal with it in in higher amounts? So you can use this study as a reference for even things like protection training, search and rescue dogs, like search and rescue dogs that may have to like search in the rain or bad weather or stuff like that is you may want to be adding things like this in milder forms before they hit the big game, right? Just like with protection training. If you want a dog to do well in protection training and there's going to be some stress if they're actually doing protection, um, attacking someone who wants to hurt them, is that's why we also do things where you expose the dogs to maybe getting hit and stuff like that and someone fighting back in milder forms causing stress 
so that eventually if when they're in the real situation where someone's probably going to hit them harder and things like that, they're less likely to not do the behavior. All right. So next study that I want to show, and this is our this is our third one that I put here is where, where are we? Okay. The next one, this one was in 1966, and this was called Recovery of Responses During Mild Punishment. Um, and we have it over here, and I put, uh, basically put a summary again. And this one was uh, with, this one was done with pigeons, and it seemed like the setup was pretty similar to the, to the first study that, that, that we showed. And um, what we have here is, they dug a little bit deeper, I mostly into the sort of things we saw over here in the 1960 study with, with Azrin. Um, things that were interesting in this one was mostly that they want you want to consider the effect of the transient emotional state. And I like what they did in here is where they put more um, symmetry between punishment and reinforcement. So, so they highlighted the fact that even in the earlier studies that a novel, a novel stressor, something like punishment is it gives, there's, there's an emotional component of it that could almost suppress everything for, for a small amount of time with punishment. So that when you're judging, when you're comparing the right level of punishment, when it's competing, we're talking about competing motivators, basically, to how reinforce to reinforcement. That's why I put a I put I made a little chart back over here. Um, I made this chart over here. I wrote to do a behavior. You know, when a, when an animal's questioning themselves or a dog is questioning themselves to do a behavior, there's always a decision process. You know, what are what's the reinforcement? What's good about doing the behavior? What's bad about doing doing the behavior? Yes versus no. And I like talking about competing motivators because in this in this study it's very simple. You know, they're just talking about shock and food as the as a punishment and reinforcer. But after you have to consider when you're making the judgment is initially what punishment you have to be careful to make the the assumption that this is what is the right level of intensity of punishment for long-term results. But they also in the study mention how you can even see something similar with reinforcement, that normally in these experiments, what you'll get is, um, is they're using food, which is not necessarily novel to, to the animals, right? It's not necessarily novel to, to the animals. So you're not gonna, it's not gonna be initially more motivational to the animals. But if we compare this to dog training, we're also gonna see things like we're using a punishment that has been working at a certain level, but then the, the, what the dog would like to do, the reinforcement may potentially, especially when it's novel, be more reinforcing than normal. So that's why a dog may say, obey a leave it command to not break a command, you know, to stay away from its dog food on the floor, but then you have something really smelly or a hot dog or something they may not have had before, and they challenge that punishment because there's a competing motivator. Is a, is it, it, you get the idea that it's, you know, that there's, you know, through this, that there's definitely symmetry between the two, that they're not very different. They're on opposite ends of the spectrum. So, so you can look at that one and it's, it's a good reference by looking, you know, by, by looking over there. Other things to mention, I don't really have on the notes over here that, um, that, that are interesting in the study is that you do get with, with punishment is just like you get more suppression of a behavior when there's initial punishment, you also get a spike in the reinforcement behavior when the punishment goes away before you get back to a normal normal response rate. So what does that mean too? When we're talking about punishment with with training 
with training, training dogs, is if once someone decides to use punishment, especially if it is not at a level that has completely suppressed the behavior, that's very hard to get a recovery from the behavior, is once that punishment goes away, the dogs generally do the unwanted behavior more, even more intense than than they did before the punishment was introduced introduced until it goes back to a baseline a baseline level okay so those are things to consider and we want to i i highly recommend they're not the easiest reading but i did put the um i, I did put the summaries the the summaries on each of these links is as a professional dog trainer know your references if you don't just want to mimic, um, understand the science behind it, form your own opinions so you can change things. And especially with punishment, I believe as a professional dog trainer is you really want to understand it well because it is not cut and dry. Every dog is different. Every situation is different. Even the same level of punishment on different dogs is going to be considered. On one dog, it might be considered moderate. On another dog, a certain level is considered severe. On another dog, it is considered very severe. So you need to be able to recognize these mostly by cause and effect and what you are seeing. So you want to be able to see things with your own eyes to know what category are these things falling into and you need to know you really need to understand is how we prep the dogs for punishment what different ways do we protect um prep them for punishment especially when it comes to using the same form of punishment or a punishment that we're going to potentially um um, potentially used to completely suppress a behavior such as like housebreak and invisible fence and stuff like that is how much do we want to expose the animal to something and can we backfire some can we backfire where a tool that we were going to use does not become effective because we effectively created a dog that's immune to it at least at the levels that the tool is capable of of doing okay so recap our objective was how do we start our decision process in regards to what level intensity of punishment to use during the training plans. Remember, this is a little piece of the whole training plan. It is a piece of knowledge that you use in your decision-making process. It is not just what you do when we're training a dog. Understand your Lima. Base, base your decisions off of Lima and Sinopraxis especially. Don't forget your replacement behaviors. A lot of things that we consider to use punishment for can sometimes be addressed without ever even using punishment. Please remember that. All right. But when we do need to use punishment, we know it cannot be addressed in other ways. Know your science to make informed decisions. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining me live on this one. And I will be back on Wednesday for Q&A. And please be sure, if you have any questions or want to talk about this and in and, and Q&A, let the questions rip on it because this is an important subject just as, just as all. all right. Enjoy the rest of your weekend, everybody.